Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, can people hear me online? Yes, okay, great. So uh, I'm Paul Hain, and it's my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Zibby Turtle from the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University. Um, Zibby, uh, Dr. Turtle, earned her bachelor's degree in physics from MIT and a PhD in planetary science from the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. Um, Zibby's research spans a range of topics in planetary surface processes, especially impact processes. And she was a key member of the Cassini uh, science team, Cassini Huygens science team during its mission to Saturn and Titan. Um, she played a, a key role in both the imaging and radar teams, making uh, several important discoveries using the first detailed images of Titan's surface. Um, she is also principal investigator, fast forwarding quite a bit, uh, principal investigator of the Europa imaging system, uh, which consists of two different cameras on board the Europa Clipper mission. And she, as you will hear, is the principal investigator of the Dragonfly mission. Um, I first encountered Zibi as part of the Cassini team and I think, you know, she uh, encapsulates one of those rare examples of people who fall in that place in the Venn diagram be between doing excellent science and also being a pleasure to work with, which is, I think, why she's risen through the ranks to become, <laughs> become uh, a leader in the field. Um, and I also wanted to highlight, if, especially for, for the students in the audience, if you have a chance, just Google Zibby Turtle. APL, the first hit is this wonderful article. It's a, a feature piece that was done by APL on, on Zibi and her career trajectory. I wanted to read one of the quotes from Zibi from that article, which is, quasars and neutron stars and black holes are fascinating, but you can actually go to planets. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, let's hear from Zibi about the Dragonfly mission. So for those online, we will be monitoring the chat. So if you have questions, please uh, feel free to post them there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to be here to speak. I hope everyone can hear me online. Good, okay, thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be giving a talk in person. Um, it's, been a, it's been a while um, since I've uh, not been doing it just on Zoom, but I'm glad we can do a, a hybrid here today. Um, and I also wanted to say no disrespect to quasars and black holes. <laughs> it's, all, it's all good. It's all good. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm I'm really pleased to be here to talk about uh, our Dragonfly mission. Uh, Dragonfly was just to give you a sense of where we are in the mission. Dragonfly was selected as a New Frontiers mission in June 2019, um, and we are in our phase B, our preliminary design phase, coming up to our PDR next fall. So, uh, so it's a busy time. All our subsystem in and instruments are going to be starting their PDRs in the next few months. Uh, and I'd just like to highlight that um, you know, all of these missions are the work of a lot of people. There are hundreds of people working on Dragonfly across the country, around the world. This is a picture from our uh, team meeting. We had a hybrid team meeting last November. Um, and uh, there, there are a lot of people that are uh, behind what I'm going to be talking about to you today. So why do we want to go to Titan? We don't know how uh, life came to form on Earth. And we can't easily go back and study our prebiotic history. Biology kind of overprints everything. So we look to other places in the solar system that can give us information about how these processes occurred. And in many ways, especially chemically, Titan is very much like the early Earth. And so in that sense, it holds uh, important information uh, for us to learn about uh, the, uh, the early prebiotic chemistry. So Titan is the largest of Saturn's uh, 62 moons or so. Um, it stands out in this image here because it's larger than all the other satellites, but also because you can't actually see its surface. It's got this gorgeous atmosphere um, that at visible wavelengths is, is hard to see through from, uh, from orbit. The atmosphere was actually detected um, more than uh, 
century ago now um, and confirmed spectroscopically uh, in the, the 40s um, as, uh, as having uh, methane in it. And this is a very unique environment. None of the satellites in the solar system have this kind of, this is uh, Titan with all of its cousins, um, none of the satellites in the solar system have this kind of atmosphere, but no, neither do the planets. So this is Titan to scale with, um, with a number of, of other bodies in the solar system. It's actually between Mercury and Mars in size, um, but its atmosphere is between Venus and Earth in terms of the uh, surface pressure. It's about one and a half times the surface pressure uh, here at Earth, or about four times the, uh, uh, the density. If that screen goes off, is that indicative of any interruption in communications? Good, okay. Uh, some facts about Titan. Uh, so it's the second largest moon in the solar system just behind uh, Ganymede at Jupiter. The surface gravity is about one seventh terrestrial gravity. The surface temperature is 94 Kelvin, uh, which makes all the weather we've been having this winter look really warm. <laughs> Um, and at these temperatures, the atmospheric composition is like our atmosphere, mostly nitrogen, but the next major constituent is methane, which makes all sorts of exciting things happen. Uh, and then underneath this atmosphere, when you look at infrared wavelengths, is, uh, um, is a surface uh, for which the bedrock is composed of water ice. The atmosphere is really extended. There's low gravity, it's a dense atmosphere. Um, so to compare, oops, to compare uh, Titan and, and Earth, the, um, you know, the, tropo, the tropopause on Earth is much lower. The tropopause on Titan is up at about 40 kilometers altitude. Cassini's lowest flyby was at 900 kilometers altitude, and it took about a year to get us there uh, in terms of planning to make sure the spacecraft was safe because there's so much atmosphere up at, at, that, uh, at that altitude. So it's a much more extended atmosphere than we're used to thinking of. And then beneath all of this, the atmosphere and the bedrock, there's a uh, liquid water ocean. So like, like many of the moons in the outer solar system, uh, Titan is an ocean world. So the chemistry in Titan's atmosphere, um, because of this methane, is particularly interesting. The methane's broken down uh, at the top of the atmosphere, and the recombination of the, the pieces makes very complex carbon molecules. And these molecules fall through the atmosphere. They're the source of the hazes uh, that make it hard to see the surface at visible wavelengths. And then this material falls out onto the surface. So now you have all of this rich carbon material sitting on the surface of an icy moon where it's had the possibility to mix with liquid water, um, possibly for extended periods of time. And that's what makes Titan such uh, an important destination for understanding early prebiotic chemical processes. Uh, so to talk a little bit more uh, about the context of Titan, Titan and Saturn's year are 29 and a half Earth years. Um, and its axial tilt is actually, the axial tilt of the system is slightly more than the axial tilt uh, of, of Earth. So the seasons are very much like our seasons in northern winter. The North Pole isn't illuminated, but on Titan, it's not just a few months, it's several years um, of, of time before the, the sun rises again. Titan is tidally locked to Saturn, so the same side always faces Saturn, and its orbital period and day are uh, 16 Earth days long. So the exploration of the Saturnian system um, seems to kind of fall in the cadence of Titan years. Um, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, Voyager 2 all flew by late 70s, early 80s around the northern vernal equinox in the, you know, at Titan. Uh, and then the Cassini mission uh, started in late southern summer um, and extended through, again, the northern vernal equinox, which was great because we got a awesome comparative data set between the Voyager observations and the Cassini observations. And then Cassini carried through the northern, uh, uh, the northern summer solstice. So we have almost half a year of, uh, of Titan data uh, from Cassini, which is spectacular. Uh, the Huygens probe landed um, soon after Cassini arrived in the system. That was in January of 2005. Uh, so Dragonfly, with a timescale of the New Frontiers uh, 4 program, will arrive 
one Titan year after, uh, after Huygens, uh, which is actually really convenient because we know what the atmosphere was like at this time in Titan's year. We know what the weather was like um, at, at this time, and uh, so we can really leverage what we learned from, uh, from Cassini and Huygens for the, the Dragonfly mission. So Voyager, when it flew by, took spectacular images of Titan's atmosphere, <laughs> mostly, um, and the hazes in the atmosphere. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful data set, and it turns out if you know what to look for, you can also prove that at very low signal to noise, Voyager did see the surface of, of Titan. But you kind of have to know the answer before you can demonstrate that that's the case. But in the 90s, um, with HST, we finally got a look at the surface. Very low resolution, but it showed us that there were persistent features on the surface of Titan. Um, and this answered um, part of a, a key question, because the methane in Titan's atmosphere has a fairly short lifetime compared to, uh, you know, compared to geological and, and solar system timescales. Uh, so the methane will persist for about, the, of the current inventory can persist for about uh, 10 million years, maybe. So we need some sort of mechanism for resupply if the atmosphere is long lived, which we believe it is. Um, and one early hypothesis was that there was a, just a global ocean of, uh, of liquid methane sitting on the, the surface to, to resupply the atmosphere. But we could see from the observations uh, from HST and later from, uh, from Keck that there were clearly surface features that were reproducible. Um, and we didn't know what the dark and the bright features were, but uh, it clearly wasn't entirely uh, just dark liquid. Uh, so Cassini was a, um, a, a very large spacecraft with a dozen instruments designed to study all aspects of the Saturnian system. And it carried with it uh, the Huygens probe. This is the, the, um, the heat shield for the Huygens probe, which is shown here on the right. Um, this is a probe designed by ESA to descend through Titan's atmosphere, make measurements of the atmosphere and possibly the surface. At the time the Huygens probe was designed, we didn't know if the surface was liquid or solid. Uh, so it had to be designed to be able to float and to send back useful data, whether or not it landed in a liquid or a solid, which it, it uh, succeeded at admirably. Uh, it had half a, dozen, uh, half a dozen instruments as well. Cassini had a number of instruments that were designed to peer through the atmosphere to observe Titan's surface. Uh, one of the, those was the cameras, uh, which are primarily visible imaging, but extended far enough, enough out into the infrared to take advantage of the lower haze opacity at long wavelengths and uh, windows in the, uh, the spectrum of methane. So this little filter here, <laughs> uh, the CB3 filter, um, is what allowed the cameras on Cassini to do global mapping of the, the surface of Titan. And Eric Karkoschka took 20,000 images taken over the lifetime of the Cassini mission to, come, to form this, uh, this map uh, of the, the surface, which happily matches the same features that we saw in the 90s with HST and, uh, and later with Keck, so that was good. Uh, Cassini also had the, vis the visual and infrared mapping spectrometer, VIMS, um, which uh, extended further out into the infrared, um, out to about five microns, but is similarly limited by the windows in the, uh, the spectrum of methane in the atmosphere. And so you don't get a continuous spectrum of the surface of Titan. You get, uh, you get a, you know, several, several windows. That's nonetheless enough to show that there are different materials on the surface of Titan. What we don't know is their detailed composition. We know that this area near the equator is dark organics. And we know that this area, these areas are bright organics. <laughs> and we know that the materials that show up in purple in this enhanced color map are, uh, have, a, uh, have a higher liquid water content, or not like, ooh, that'd be cool, uh, have a higher water ice content. Um, but there's no exposed water ice that we could detect directly on the, on the surface. So one of the big mysteries remaining after Cassini is what are the compositions of these, uh, the solid materials on uh, Titan's surface. Cassini also had a radar instrument uh, that could perform, among other operating modes, synthetic aperture radar or imaging of the surface in strips as, as uh, uh, during the, the flybys that Cassini performed of Titan. 
uh, and mapped about 60%, uh, maybe 65% of the, the surface in this way. So we've gotten this very complementary data set that has revealed in a fairly short span of time the, uh, the geology and the geography of Titan. So I'll talk about that a little bit just to give a sense of, of what, what we found. So one of the big questions starting in the 90s when we st first got our, our uh, map of the surface from uh, HST is what these dark regions at the equator were. Again, were they uh, seas of liquid hydrocarbon? Um, what was this bright region uh, here, which was in fact named in the 90s uh, Xanadu, um, the first named feature on the surface. So it turns out that these are seas at low latitudes, but they're seas of sand. Um, and so this is a synthetic aperture radar image. If you're not used to looking at synthetic aperture radar images, it's basically showing brightness uh, is, is scaled by the, the roughness of the surface material at the, the wavelength of the radar, which is 2.2 centimeters. So things that are dark are very smooth at that wavelength and things that are bright are rough at that wavelength. So these features, these dark linear features, and there's another another example um, are sand dunes. But on Titan, the sand is a different composition. It's about the same size as sand on Earth, um, but it's organic. Uh, we don't actually know how you make organic sand grains. Um, we don't even know if they're ice sand grains with organic, you know, with an organic candy coating, or if they're organic through and through. Um, but nonetheless, there's clearly sand on the surface of Titan that is uh, that is transported and forms basically the largest Zen gardens in the solar system, wrapping almost all the way around the equator at, uh, at Titan. Absolutely spectacular features. There are a few impact craters. You can see a few here. There's one here we'll talk about more. This one, uh, again, with a synthetic aperture radar image is Synlap over here on the sub Saturnian hemisphere. The largest one is Minerva. Um, this is, the structure is about 400 kilometers in diameter. Um, these, um, there aren't that many impact craters. Uh, and that's very, again, very similar to Earth. There aren't a lot of impact craters on Earth. And that's because the Earth's surface is being modified constantly. Um, and similarly, the Titanian surface is being modified. It's being eroded uh, by Aeolian, and we'll see uh, fluvial processes and um, impact craters are eroded and buried uh, and become unrecognizable. Uh, so it's a very young surface in the context of the, the age of the Saturnian system. There are some tectonic structures. There's no real, there's no major global patterns, but there are definitely tectonic structures. Uh, again, in the synthetic rapid aperture radar image, these um, mountains, I know we're in Colorado. Um, <laughs> uh, the mountains are, you know, a, a kilometer or two high. Um, so like most of the icy satellites in the solar system, it's, it's fairly subdued uh, topography. But nonetheless, there are, uh, you know, there are tectonic processes that have uh, uh, modified and created surface, uh, surface features. And everywhere you see, uh, at least at low latitudes, the dunes wrapping in and around these, uh, uh, these features. There are hints of cryovolcanism, of cold volcanism, uh, in which the lava um, on Titan would be liquid water, or maybe a liquid water ammonia mix. Um, this is one of the, the um, most compelling examples, where you have a mountain here, which is a kilometer and a half high, sitting right next to a pit that's a kilometer and a half deep, there are other ways to form that, but um, with combined with a, a flow field, which appears in the, the radar and the, uh, the spectral data from VIMS, it's uh, reasonably compelling that this could have been a, a cryovolcanic feature. But with uh, instrumentation on Cassini, we saw no evidence of active uh, warm areas on the, the surface of Titan. And then there are channels, and these channels are everywhere. So even though there are dunes all the way, you know, kind of almost all the way around the equator, which suggests that the equator is a fairly arid place, uh, there are also channels. And this is a visible image uh, from the, the Huygens probe as it descended down through uh, Titan's atmosphere to its, uh, to its surface uh, just south of the equator here. And it wasn't until later in the mission, until a few years into the mission, that we finally found the, the liquids on the surface. It turns out there is 
a little bit of liquid at the South Pole, which we saw early on. Um, but the large bodies of liquid, these seas, are all at Titan's North Pole. Uh, and there are also a lot of lakes. So this is, again, is a synthetic aperture radar map overlaid on the ISS, the visible wavelength imaging. And there are three large seas like GMRA here, as you can see here. The North Pole is about 500 kilometers across. Kraken Mare is like 1,100 kilometers from north to south. Sorry. Um, and then on the other side of the pole, there are these spectacular cookie cutter lakes. And we could spend an entire seminar just talking about the, the lakes and the seas on Titan because it's, uh, um, uh, it's just fascinating to have, you know, to have li yeah, liquid uh, on the surface. It's just so familiar to us, uh, but not something we, we see elsewhere in the solar system. And Titan has um, a, a methane cycle. So the equivalent of our water cycle but the methane in the atmosphere uh, plays this role on Titan. And so what you're seeing here is a, a, some images and a, a, a sequence of images taken by the cameras um, on Cassini, looking down on the, the North Pole. So you can see the gorgeous uh, lakes and seas here and the clouds, these bright features are, are clouds in Titan's uh, early summer um, of, of methane. And at a couple points in the mission, we actually saw evidence of rainfall on the surface. So we had this very convenient arrow-shaped cloud uh, that, <laughs> that uh, told us where to look a month later. And when we looked a month later, uh, this area is now dark. Um, and the, uh, uh, the evidence strongly suggests that this is because the weather system caused precipitation uh, and the surface was wet uh, over this very large uh, region, as you can see, this is yeah, this is the thousand kilometer scale bar. So this is a very extensive uh, rainfall at low latitudes, um, several years after Cassini arrived, and more than a year after the northern vernal equinox, as the the weather patterns tracked the sun to the north. And then, of course, the the Huygens probe uh, landed on the uh, landed on the surface um, and sent back this scene. Uh, this is, of course, our moon. Not Titan, but it gives a sense of the scale. So you can get a sense of the scale of these cobbles um, that are probably water ice rocks uh, in this gravel plain, which again looks very familiar. It looks very terrestrial or, or even or even Martian. Um, but the materials are different, and so even though uh, the conditions and the materials are different, we're seeing very similar uh, landforms and structures and processes to those that we have here on Earth. It would be a very familiar landscape. So in Titan, we have all the key ingredients that we know to be necessary for life. There's energy in the form of sunlight that drives this, this rich photochemistry in the atmosphere. There's the organic material that results from that chemistry um, that falls out onto the surface. Um, and then there's a liquid in the form of water in the interior ocean in the present day, uh, but also available at the surface in the past at sites of impact cratering or possibly cryovolcanism. And then there's a second liquid in the, in the system, which is, uh, which is the liquid methane. And there's the possibility that liquid methane could support the development of exotic biological systems. And on Titan, not only do we get to study the results of that chemistry, but we can study that in the context of a, a planetary environment that has the same kinds of processes that would have transported and mixed and modified materials here uh, on the early Earth. So Titan gives us the opportunity to look for answers to questions like what makes a planet, or in this case a moon, uh, habitable? What are the chemical processes that led to the development of life? Uh, and even has life developed elsewhere in our solar system? Now at 94 Kelvin, we certainly don't expect that life as we know it would be terribly happy. On the, on the surface, we have no uh, reason to believe that chemistry has taken that leap to biology. Uh, on Titan, but uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't ask the question. Um, and Cassini has showed us where we want to go to look for answers to this, these questions. I mean, basically, Titan has been doing chemistry experiments for us that we can't do in the laboratory. And so what we want to do is go pick up the results of those experiments. And we know uh, from the Cassini data where we want to go. But the scientific challenge became how do we get, became how do we get a, you know, a suite of capable capable instruments to multiple places. But we already do this on Mars, 
um, we take, you know, the, we have rovers with, you know, entire payloads that take everything with them from place to place on Mars. But on Titan, the atmosphere allows us to, to uh, fly rather than to drive. Um, and so that's why uh, Dragonfly is designed as an octocopter, uh, as a rotorcraft lander um, that will allow us to get from place to place on Titan to make these measurements in environments that have different geological uh, histories, um, et cetera. But on Titan, unlike Mars, we do not have infrastructure. So we don't have a fleet of orbiters uh, that can relay data back. Um, so we have to do direct to Earth communication from the surface of Titan uh, with a high gain antenna that we carry with us from place to place. Um, and we have to do our own scouting. We have the data from Cassini, but we don't have high rise uh, in orbit at Titan uh, yet. So, uh, so Dragonfly also needs to be able to be self-sufficient in terms of scouting. And I'll talk to you a little more about the, um, uh, the exploration strategy. So the, um, so the Dragonfly mission elements are uh, the spacecraft, the cruise stage, that will take us from Earth to Titan. Uh, there's an entry vehicle, which is the, the heat shield and the back shell that will protect the uh, rotorcraft as we descend um, down through the atmosphere. And then there's the rotorcraft itself. Uh, as I said, we carry the entire payload from place to place. We can make measurements primarily on the surface, but we can also do some uh, aerial measurements as well. We do direct to earth communication. Um, <clears throat> and the high gain antenna, because it has to be articulated to point at earth, uh, you'll see these two boxes on top of the high gain antenna. Those are actually cameras. We can use the fact that the high gain antenna points to be able to point that to take imaging as well. And Dragonfly is designed to use an MMRTG, the multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator, as its power source. And we use this to charge a battery that is uh, from which we have the, the power for uh, flight and uh, science activities. And the inefficiency uh, that generates a lot of heat in the MMRTG is excellent because that allows us to keep the interior of the lander warm. Um, and just because we're used to kind of drones that are this scale, uh, Dragonfly is not. <laughs> Dragonfly is basically the size of the Perseverance rover. Um, uh, and that's me uh, with one of the prototype um, rotors. Um, so that just gives you a little bit little better sense of the, the scale of the, the lander. Uh, so our launch is scheduled in 2027 with Titan arrival by 2034. We do direct atmospheric entry. We don't need to go into orbit um, at Saturn or at Titan. Um, and as I mentioned uh, before, we get there um, at a similar time of year, about one Titan year after the descent of the Huygens probe. And we're going to a similar near equatorial latitude. Um, the entry sequence is not the seven minutes of terror um, because Titan's atmosphere is so extended. Uh, it takes about two hours to get from the entry interface down to the, the surface. Uh, that is beneficial in that there's a lot more time to sequence all of the activities that have to take place. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's any less terrifying. It's just integrated over a different time scale. Um, and at the very bottom, as you saw in the video, we actually release from the back shell and fly to the, the first landing site under Dragonfly's own power. And the initial landing site is targeted uh, in the equatorial dunes. This is done for a few reasons. One is that the dunes um, provide access to a couple of different materials uh, in that the dunes themselves have an organic composition, but often the interdune areas, the, the big flat spaces in between the dunes, have a water ice component. And so in very close proximity of a few kilometers, we have access to two different types of materials. But the other benefit of this uh, landing site is it's right near the Selk impact crater, which is about 80 kilometers in diameter, uh, and a site where liquid water may have had the opportunity to mix with, um, with the uh, carbon-rich material on Titan. And so by landing here and being able to explore into the deposits associated with the impact crater, um, we have access to, uh, to materials that have had a very different geologic history than the, uh, the organic uh, dunes. Uh, so this is not Titan, this is Earth. This is the Namib Desert, which is actually a very good analog for the types of dunes we have on Titan. Um, and so this is a very good example uh, from this aerial image. You can see the dunes and then these wide, flat inner dunes. In most of the uh, dune 
Um, so this type, these longitudinal dunes, half or sometimes more than half of the area is actually interdune rather than the, the dune material itself. And here you can see the distinction very, very clearly, um, uh, except on, on Earth, the, the sand and the interdune materials both have a silicate composition. Of course, another benefit to this area is that these interdunes are a few kilometer wide, hundreds of kilometer long, flat areas which from a landing perspective is also, uh, is also very beneficial. Uh, and so over um, the nominal mission of 3.3 uh, years, which is about 74 Titan days, the traverse uh, will go from uh, wherever we land in the landing ellipse, uh, you know, in the dunes and inner dunes, and then into the uh, deposits associated with the crater, uh, eject deposits and possibly down into the into the crater itself. Um, <clears throat> I should say this is exceedingly exaggerated uh, topography. Um, the the dunes and inner dunes are or the dunes um, are fifty to one hundred meters high in general. Um, the crater is is uh, you know a few is several hundred meters deep. Uh, this is you know two hundred kilometers long, so it's it's very exaggerated. The topography is is uh, is it's quite low. Um, and in this uh, traverse, depending on where we land in the landing ellipse, uh, we'll explore a couple of dozen unique sites um, as we go through uh, to the impact crater. So I mentioned the fact that we need to scout our own um, landing sites. We actually have what we call a leapfrog strategy, where when we um, take off from a site to go to a previously scouted landing site, we'll actually fly further scout out a new landing site and then come back to the previously scouted landing site um, and uh, then uh, discuss what we learn uh, at in the scouting observations in terms of uh, hazards at the you know, potential hazards at the new potential landing site, um, as well as uh, uh, materials of, of scientific interest. Um, and no doubt uh, heated discussions will ensue about where best to, uh, to, to choose our next landing site. The, the nominal schedule is uh, about once every other Titan day, so about once uh, an Earth month. So Dragonfly really does spend most of its time uh, on the, the surface of, um, uh, of Titan, uh, making me measurements, sending data back, performing the ground in the loop uh, uh, operations. And no one has to live on Titan time. Um, <laughs> that, would be, that would be a bit of a stretch. Uh, because of the time scale, actually, it, it works fairly well to just have kind of regular business hours and the, the ground and the loop communication uh, can work in, on that time scale quite nicely. So that's another convenience that Titan has offered us. Uh, so the science um, objectives are, are multidisciplinary. The primary focus is the prebiotic chemistry, uh, understanding the chemical components available and the processes that have, uh, and whether they've produced biologically relevant compounds. But we want to put that in the context of the Titan environment. So we want to understand the methane cycle. Uh, we want to understand Titan's atmosphere. We want to understand the uh, transport and modification and mixing of organics on the surface. We want to understand the opportunities uh, to for those uh, materials to mix with liquid reservoirs, either uh, methane or uh, liquid water, uh, both at the surface and, uh, and in the interior. And then uh, we have the capability to search uh, for chemical biosignatures if, if they are present. But it's primarily a chemistry mission to understand the, the early steps uh, in that prebiotic chemistry. And we have a, a suite of instruments, the Dragonfly Mass Spectrometer uh, being built by Goddard, uh, this is uh, based on the heritage from the SAM mass spectrometer that is on Mars, on Curi the Curiosity rover. Uh, DRAMS uh, is uh, fed by material ingested from Draco. You can see we had some fun with the names of the different uh, parts of the uh, different elements of the payload. So Draco is the drill for acquisition of complex organics. It's being built by Honeybee Robotics. Uh, there are two rotary percussive drills. Um, we use pneumatic transport to bring the material from the, uh, the drills into the mass spectrometer. We have a geophysics and meteorology, meteorology package, um, Dragmet, uh, being built at APL with a contribution from uh, JAXA of a seismometer. Uh, and I'll talk about each of these a little more uh, in, in a little more detail. We have a camera suite. There are eight science cameras uh, being built by Millen Space Science Systems. Uh, and these cameras 
Um, there, there are two that focus high resolution on the sampling sites on either side of the lander. Uh, there are two that look downward, there are two that look forward. The downward and forward cameras can be used both on the surface uh, at high resolution, but also to do aerial imaging while we're in flight. Uh, and then we have the, um, uh, the two cameras I mentioned before on the high gain antenna. Um, and because we can, uh, because a high gain antenna is articulated, we can use that to build up a panorama all the way around uh, the, all the way around the lander. Uh, and then uh, the uh, other instrument here is the, the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer um, being built by IEPL uh, that allows us to make um, compositional, uh, another way of making a compositional measurement of the surface. Um, so this is just a, a video showing the, uh, the drilling, ingesting material into the mass spectrometer where we have two different modes. Uh, there's the laser desorption mode um, and this allows us to get at aspects of the composition of the, uh, of the molecules is how we'll do our, our, our inventory of the different materials available on the, uh, uh, on the surface of Titan. And then there's also a gas chromatography mode in the, the mass spectrometer, which allows us to get at aspects of the structure of the molecules, including the handedness or the chirality. Uh, and that is one of the uh, ways of looking uh, for uh, biological versus uh, abiotic control of uh, uh, chemical processes. Um, so that's, that's one of the biosignatures we're able to, uh, to investigate. Uh, so this just shows the um, uh, DRAMs uh, in comparison to SAM and MoMA, which are two of the, the Martian uh, mass spectrometers. Uh, we, with, dra with uh, Dragonfly, because we know that there's so much very complex uh, carbon molecules in the, in the system, uh, we, we have go up to much higher um, uh, molecular masses. Uh, the uh, gamma ray neutron spectrometer uh, gives us a bulk elemental composition of the surface underneath the lander. And this allows us to classify the surface material, which helps us to decide uh, whether we want to do sampling, what kind of sampling we want to do, what kind of mass spectrometry uh, measurements we want to do. Uh, it'll also allow us to detect minor inorganic elements, and it can reveal near surface stratigraphy. So if there's water ice with a thin mantle of organic material, uh, dragons will actually be sensitive to, uh, to that layering, which will be, uh, which will be very valuable. The um, uh, the DragMet instrument, which is a suite of uh, meteorological and geophysical uh, sensors, allows us to uh, monitor the atmosphere, the temperature, pressure, all the, all the usual, right? Temperature, pressure, humidity, um, wind speed and direction, uh, look for diurnal and spatial variations, and we can do low altitude in the scheme of Titan's atmosphere uh, profiles as well. Um, we have ways to constrain the regolith properties uh, look for the thermal response, which can give indication of dampness and porosity, uh, measure the dielectric constant. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we have, uh, um, we have uh, seismic sensors as well that will allow us to characterize the level of uh, seismic activity on, uh, on an, an ocean world. Um, and whether there's a variation, for example, with the orbital phase, there's been a lot of work, of course, in planetary seismology. There's a lot of interesting modes you get in a, uh, in a system where you have a, an ice shell over a, you know, a global liquid water ocean. Um, how much we'll be able to detect will depend a lot on Titan um, and how much seismic activity uh, there is. Um, but it's going to be really interesting to find out. And then this gives kind of a sense of the different types of views. This is, again, not Titan, uh, but it gives a sense of the different types of views uh, that we will have um, with the different imagers. We have LED, an LED system to illuminate the, the surface as well. Um, we can do imaging in Titan ambient light, but the LEDs allow us to um, get at different aspects of the composition. The cameras are, are basically visible wavelength. They go a little into the the near IR, and they'll be have bare filters, which are which will have wide, um, uh, which will be broadband uh, filters. So we'll have the capability to get kind of three color um, observations, but in the broadband. And so the LEDs allow us to to narrow in on some of the the compositions. And with the uh, UV uh, LED, we can actually look at night 
uh, for uh, fluorescence, uh, which a number of organic materials do. So that, that could be a, a kind of, would be a really cool and kind of spooky <laughs> observation at night on Titan surface. Uh, so there are a lot of things that we're doing right now. We have um, a student and early career guest investigator program that we uh, were happily, uh, was, this was proposed as a science enhancement option and happily NASA selected it to function, uh, to start in the development phases. So this allows us to bring in uh, students um, in the, uh, you know, in phase B uh, through the development phase and then again in phase E as we get into science operations. Uh, the, the goal of the program is to really expand uh, opportunities um, for people to, uh, to work with missions, especially people that don't already have connections to missions or even, or even planetary science. Uh, so this is, we're in the early years of this, but it's been, uh, um, but that's been one of the things that we're, uh, that we're working on. And then of course, we're doing a lot of testing um, at this point because we need to um, demonstrate that the hardware uh, will work in the in the Titan environment. Um, so we have, I'll start over here, uh, on the right here, uh, we've been doing testing in some of the wind tunnels. Um, we have a bit of a different situation. A lot of facilities are designed to go down to low pressure. Not as many facilities are designed to go to higher pressure, which is, uh, which is what we need for Titan, but we can uh, match, uh, you know, different parameters like the Reynolds number, et cetera, to simulate aspects of, uh, of flight on Titan. Uh, and then here, uh, here. Uh, then at APL, um, we have, uh, this is our, our small Titan environment chamber. Um, and we've been doing testing in this for a, a couple of years now, bringing um, uh, different components in. This can go down to uh, Titan temperatures and up to Titan pressure. Um, and uh, this is a, a Draco uh, sampling uh, test being done here. But we just um, completed the build. Uh, an installation of our large Titan chamber. Um, so just to give you, just remember how big this looks, because this is very roughly uh, how big that is compared to the, the new chamber. And this chamber is designed to be able to fit the entire Dragonfly lander in it. Um, so it is, a, uh, it is a Titan, and that's currently what we're calling it. Uh, we also have um, a couple of, of test, uh, test beds. Um, test platforms uh, that we are using to demonstrate uh, hardware and software associated with the, um, uh, the mobile and autonomous uh, mobility on Titan. Um, and uh, I will end here with a video um, uh, from some testing we did in the Imperial Dunes last, uh, last fall uh, with one of these uh, half-scale test beds um, flying over the dunes, again, a, a good analog to the, the kind of terrain that we'll need to navigate, um, navigate on Titan. Um, so you'll see interspliced in the, in the video they produced the, the Titan animation and the, uh, um, the actual Earth imagery. But it's very convenient that Earth offers us these, uh, these great test facilities um, to be able to, uh, to demonstrate the, uh, the hardware and the software for autonomous flight. Uh, so I'll let, I'll let this play and uh, wrap up, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. So uh, I believe the standard is not to take questions online. Uh, the state can take a question and have any questions, and so any questions in the audience. Okay. Um, are there any Um, oh, yes, thank you for reminding me. Uh, right, so the, the question is whether there are events that occur during, could occur during flights or between flights that would uh, affect uh, future, future flights. Um, so the, just trying to think of, think of where to start. The um, uh, so Dragonfly will do pre-flight checks um, just the way we do, you know, we do with any flights here on Earth, it'll evaluate the, the weather, uh, decide whether or not to, well, it'll relay back to Earth the data uh, indicating whether or not it is safe to fly, whether the winds or um, other aspects of the weather 
uh, would preclude flight. Um, so uh, that will be sent back to Earth. We will you know, send back a command to fly or not to fly. There is a long light time uh, between Earth between Titan, Earth, and Titan. Uh, so the final arbiter will be Dragonfly. So the intent is that Dragonfly would not fly uh, if uh, any of those conditions had, had changed or if it was not safe to fly. Uh, so we would not expect to be flying in, in adverse conditions. Um, now, if, the, if we didn't fly, that would affect the, the next set of operations, right? If we don't fly on a, a certain day, we can try another, you know, we can try the next Earth day. Uh, other than that, we would probably wait another Titan day. So it definitely has ripple effects in terms of the operations. Uh, if we uh, fly, if something happens during flight, Dragonfly's, you know, autonomy is designed to identify the, the safest landing site nearby and put down, or just to put down if it needs to, um, and uh, make do. Uh, there's kind of a, a hierarchy of, of scenarios, again, in most of those events, because the, uh, the intent is to uh, identify safe landing sites, um, we would not necessarily expect it to affect the ability to, to fly. Um, but it would certainly affect future operations because then we'd be in some place we weren't intending to be, to be in in terms of our, our operations. The, uh, the octocopter design with the two, um, with the four pairs of rotors means that we could actually fly without a rotor if, uh, if something were to, to happen to one of the rotors. But, um, but kind of this phase of the mission is envisioning everything that could possibly go wrong. So, um, so there are certainly, uh, you know, anomalies that, uh, that could occur, uh, but we're trying to design for all of those contingencies, of course. Thank you. The first question is from Arvind Arachia. Given the ambient temperature on Titan, would it have been of interest to investigate the use of high TC conductors for power efficient magnetic field generation, either for the octorotors or even in the magnetic fields employed by DRAMs to perhaps offer greater MZ resolution? Um, so I'm not a magnetospheric scientist. Um, the, uh, the, the area in which we have tried to keep things simple, which I know sounds perhaps ironic for a dragonfly, uh, is that we are trying to make use of technologies that already exist. Um, and so in almost every part, well, in fact, in, in pretty much every system in the lander, uh, we haven't had to invent anything. We haven't had to uh, use new technologies. Um, we can base the, uh, the, uh, the lander itself, the design, uh, and the instrumentation on, on hardware that, that already exists. So there are a lot of really interesting things we could investigate and that we could experiment with, but in a, a cost-capped you know, New Frontiers program, what we, what we need to do is the, you know, what, we, what we already can do so that we can take the next step scientifically. So it, it, it could be fascinating, but we don't have the resources to, to do that kind of experimentation in Dragonfly. Thank you. I have several more. If you want me to go ahead, or Right, so, uh, so there are a, a few different aspects of that question. So first of all, um, the weather we have seen on Titan tends to follow the seasons. So when Cassini arrived um, it, uh, in 2004 and late southern summer, the weather systems were at the South Pole and it was several years. We didn't see weather at low latitudes. The storm I showed where it rained at lower latitudes was at minus 30 degrees, actually wasn't even quite equatorial. That was in 2010. So there was a, you know, a long um, amount of time before the weather moved that far, that far north, and we're on a similar arrival time scale with Dragonfly. Um, so we would not expect there to be um, storms like that uh, at the latitude of Dragonfly until maybe an extended mission. Um, which would be excellent. Um, however, 
uh, we have, you know, half a year of, well, we have a little more because we've been monitoring Titan's weather since, uh, since the 90s with HST. So we have a few decades, but not, you know, much more than a Titan year of, of data about Titan's atmosphere. And we know that, that weather can be unpredictable. Uh, so we do need to make sure that the system would tolerate rain. Uh, one of the ways of doing that, as I was saying, is we wouldn't fly if it were raining. Um, but uh, we need to make sure everything is robust to getting wet uh, with liquid uh, methane. Um, and dust mitigation is another, is another aspect, because we definitely know there's dust and sand in the, in the system, and that's another aspect of the, the design uh, to make sure that, that uh, the system is robust to working in that kind of environment. Absolutely. I'm reminded from our Zoom customers, please repeat the question from Oh, I'm so audiences. sorry. I'm so terrible at that. <laughs> Maybe I'll go around with the microphone. The next <laughs> Zoom question is from Dan Baker, who says, can you say more about the processes that lead or led to dune formation? Um, yeah, so the processes that form dunes, so I don't need to repeat these questions because you're, you're reading them. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the processes that form the dunes on Titan, the, the dunes that we see are longitudinal dunes. Uh, so in this, in this in, um, what the, this morphology of the dunes indicates, they're very long uh, dunes that tend to form in environments where you have uh, kind of two primary wind directions over, uh, you know, over the year, uh, you know, on average. Uh, and that's what we see in the Namib Desert here on Earth. There are examples on Mars as well. They're very long-lived types of dunes. They take tens of thousands of years for the, this, uh, uh, this kind of dune field uh, to form. Um, so they seem very similar to the, the kinds of dunes we see on Earth, and that can help us understand the, uh, by mapping out the dunes and their orientations, we can actually uh, use that as a constraint on the wind patterns that, uh, that has, have been experienced at the uh, equator of Titan over uh, long periods of time. Thank you. Um, so I thoroughly enjoyed watching Huygens land, and I hope to see Dragonfly land too. My question is really, um, I would like you to tell the younger people in the audience, how can they get involved in Dragonfly uh, when you get there? Or absolutely. before, or before. Or before, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, one of, the, um, one of the great opportunities we have with outer solar system exploration and the great responsibilities uh, is, uh, you know, the, the need to to bridge the generations of, of exploration. The fact that the, <laughs> the missions kind of have this Titan year cadence, uh, you know, uh, means that um, you, you have to have a, um, sorry to say too many things at once. You have to have a, you know, you have to have a, a succession plan. You have to have a way to bring new people in during the mission. Um, and it gives you the opportunity to bridge those generations, right? So with Dragonfly, we have people working on, on Dragonfly who help to design and build uh, Cassini and Huygens and can bring that, you know, that experience to the mission and also to impart that to the next generation of students who are already working, uh, working on Dragonfly. Uh, there is a lot to do. Um, and I showed the, the team picture, there are a lot of people uh, that a mission like this takes, and people are needed in all sorts of disciplines. We look at spacecraft uh, and, and uh, planetary missions, and we, we think of scientists and we think of engineers, um, and you need scientists and you need engineers, but you need graphics designers. You need people who can, uh, you know, write the, the press releases, uh, who can write the documentation, who can manage these large teams. Um, so you need all sorts of skill sets to, uh, uh, um, to develop a mission like this. So if you're interested in space exploration and you're not an engineer or a scientist, that doesn't mean you can't, don't get to, you know, don't get to, to help out because there's a lot of other activities. We need, you know, we need people who can, who are doing augmented and virtual reality, uh, et, et cetera. Um, in terms of ways to get involved uh, in the mission, there, um, uh, there are internships at most of the institutions uh, that are um, 
involved with, uh, with Dragonfly. I would, you know, look to, uh, to institutions that are doing aspects of the mission that you're interested in, apply for, for internships uh, with, those, uh, uh, with those institutions, apply to grad school or, or undergraduate programs uh, in, uh, um, at institutions with, uh, with team members or institutions that are providing hardware, uh, et cetera. Um, there will be, NASA has promised, uh, uh, um, participating scientist program. I have routine <laughs> conversations with NASA that participating scientist program should start now. Um, there are, there are, you know, this is, it's a complicated thing. Budgets are, you know, are, are something that, that, that have to be managed. And I'm not, I'm not trying to make light of that, but the earlier people get to experience it, uh, the better, right? I mean, phase E is awesome and exciting, but, but phase B is, is, Awesome and exciting too, in different ways. So, um, so we're trying to find as many ways to, you know, to involve people as possible, and uh, uh, encourage people to just keep uh, keep looking for opportunities, keep studying the things you're studying, and, um, you know, we've got another 15 years ahead of us, and hopefully there'll be lots of good ways for people to become involved. Got two more questions on the chat. First one is from David Wilson. How much redundancy is there? Can you lose one or more rotors and still fly? Uh, in the flight system, we can lose one rotor and still fly. We could potentially lose two, but it depends which two. Um, two on one arm, and, and it would be more likely that, the, um, that we would be a, a mobile uh, geophysical, I mean, a, a, we'd be a stationary geophysical and meteorology platform for which there is a, a very strong science argument, I will, I will say. There's a lot that can be done, especially seism with you know, a seismometer in a single place as opposed to moving back and forth. But, uh, but we do have some redundancy in the, in the flight system by design. Any more questions in the room, Larry? Oh, nice Thanks, Paul. I'm I'm interested. It's a great mission. I'm interested. You know, you're heading uh, on a, a tough schedule with constrained funding toward a launch date, which is uh, important to get to Saturn at the right time. And so, uh, could you say anything about the critical path or the pacing issues that the project is addressing right now? To reach launch successfully and then eventually tighten? Uh, absolutely. Um, so the, uh, right now, um, we're moving ahead toward our preliminary uh, design review, the subsystem review starting this spring, uh, and the mission preliminary design review in uh, the fall. Um, at that point, any technology development items, uh, any, not, any items that didn't, you know, haven't been flown previously, need to achieve what's called a technology readiness level of six uh, for, for PDR. And so that uh, requires that the, uh, the system or the, the subsystem be, um, the hardware be tested in a, a, a similar environment. Uh, to uh, to tighten, so that's one of the you know the primary focuses right now. Um, as I mentioned, we don't have fortunately a lot of new technologies, um, even though it, it seems like that. We are applying uh, old, not old, but we're applying existing technologies to a new environment. But that nonetheless means we means we need to means we need to uh, uh, do that that demonstration in the environment. So that's one of the that's one of the the big areas um, of the development. Um, and and then the you know the management of all the different systems coming together and making sure that you have all the requirements defined and that when there's that everyone you know all the different systems are talking to each other and having all of that work together uh, is uh, um, is another you know big aspect of of this phase of of the mission. Um, there are a number in this environment of you know issues. Uh, as many are aware, uh, with uh, um, supply chain um, and uh, you know long lead parts, and the leads on those just get longer and longer. So that's another another area that's uh, that's certainly a challenge that we're uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, mitigate by doing things as early as possible. We've got one more question on Zoom from Andrew Wilkowski. Is Dragonfly's atmospheric package able to operate during flight? Is there a good way to measure wind speed while in flight? 
Yes, uh, so we do operate in flight, um, but the, uh, so yes, um, the uh, meteorology package is designed to operate in flight in particular because we want to be able to do uh, atmospheric profiles of the lower part of the atmosphere. These only go up to a few kilometers altitude, uh, but nonetheless will provide important information about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the lower part of the atmosphere. Um, but we'll be tracking dragonfly in flight, and so we will be, by tracking, we'll know, uh, we'll know how, how fast we're moving, and dragonfly can also, you know, measure uh, progress using the optical navigation. So, uh, so dragonfly will have onboard information as well. I think that's about all we have time for. Um, if you'd like to ask some more questions, I'm sure Zibi can stick around for a couple minutes afterwards. Yeah. But in the meantime, let's thank Zibi again.